Today, I'm delighted to say I'm joined in this very special Open for the Ages roundtable by two legends, one of whom graced the list I just read out. He's a three-time Open champion and quite arguably the greatest British golfer ever, Sir Nick Faldo. Hi, Nick. Great to see you on screen and to have this time with you. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you very much. Where in the world are you joining me from? <laughs> Where in the world? Um, <laughs> yes, I'm uh, very fortunate that the beach is only uh, one block that way. It's at Pontevedra Beach, you know, uh, Florida, home of the players, uh, you know, the, the players tour, the PGA tour and the players tournament. So it, I'm fortunate to have a little beach place. So I'm able to uh, bounce between here and Orlando for my um, broadcasting duties at this uh, time of the year. Lucky for some. Well, it's great to have you on with us today. And also joining Sir Nick and myself is one of the greatest golf commentators of all time, a former open contender around the old course and a coach to champion golfers. He is the wonderful and one and only Ewan Murray. Ewan, <laughs> hello. You look like you're in a very beautiful setting there. Where are you? I'm down in uh, West Hiltington, which is part of West Sussex. And I've never mm -hmm. had an introduction like that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm here for you in the Scots. I remember, I remember, I remember playing with when he, when he shanked it. That's a hell of an introduction. <laughs> oh, that, ha that happened on a few occasions, Nick. That's not unique. <laughs> <laughs> Well, today we're here um, to discuss everything the Open for the Ages and the great action and the drama from the Opens of the past, as well as great players and great moments from over the years at the old course. So we may as well jump into it. And so, Nick, I'll come to you if that's OK, just to dive straight into why is it that St Andrews draws our attention every time when it comes to the Open? Well, it's well, my first time there was 1978. Um, so it, it, your first time you visit St Andrews is, is what really makes it so special. I mean, it, it is a golf town. I mean, I know it's the home of golf, but it's also a, a golf town where everything evolves around the history of, of our great game. Um, and so you, if you are a historian, I, I can imagine it's completely off the charts. But, you know, I'm only the basic stuff of wandering through town and knowing that the, the Morrises, Tom Morris senior and junior played and their history and the fact they're up at the they're at the end of the town in the in the in the cathedral in the in the graveyards up there and uh, um and the the fact that you know the history the hundreds of years that have gone by of the of golf being played there and then obviously then the open coming there and and then fortunately I was able to go there and it's so historic and you know, the, the stone every every piece of stone in that uh, in that town is well probably the stones thousands of years old but uh, hundreds of years old for actually being built um it's just all those sort of things and put it all to, and there's there's a genuinely a uh, buzz electricity to the town um I've, I've been there with people who don't play golf and said and they said you're right there's something about here it's, it's pretty magical in the way the obvious the way the town wraps around the uh, one and 18 um it's it's all part of it. And the fact that we have the amazing history and the, and the fact that golf course is just about laid down by nature. Mm -hmm. um, it's all, and it's probably the most strategic golf course on the planet yet. Um, it's so put all of it together. Um, that's what makes it in the RNA, of course, being right there. Uh, wow. You put all of that into the, the mixing part and that's what makes it so special. Mm, it does. It is a very special place. I've actually been fortunate enough to spend lockdown in St Andrews and my family yeah. live there. So I've been there for the last four months and yeah. only recently came back to England. But more than ever, I've been able to learn about the history and then being involved in the, the Open for the Ages. Um, and Roger McStravick is the historian that lives in the town. Yeah. And, you, you know, he can tell you stories for for hours and days and days and yeah. you're right to mention the, the the golfers who are buried in the cathedral at the end of the town and he actually told me that the, between the golfers who are buried in the end of the town there there's over 20 major champion uh, victories between them so yeah you know incredible history under the ground and above it what about <laughs> you you and what do you think makes st andrew so special when it comes to the open in one word, everything. When you drive, uh, let's say, through Cooper, which is, what, eight, nine miles away or so, there's a, 
there's a scent in the air as a golfer you're going to a very special place uh, i love what nick said about the town I, I love golf courses that start and finish in the town and north berwick would be one of these uh, lost in mouth would be another royal donor as well and you're very much part of, of the old great town and the, and the abbey uh, up at the end of north street so history takes a long time and, you know, when you think the Swilkin Bridge is over 700 years old and they used to do their washing in the <laughs> Swilkin Burn, I'm not sure they'd be allowed to do that today, but, but they used to do that. There was archery. It, it was a rabbit mm. farm until James Cheap, who was a landowner there, saved the land for, for golf. And they had a celebratory dinner in the town hall in St. Andrews up North Street. And he came in and said, I've saved the links for golf. It's many centuries ago. And standing on the first tee, you don't have to be playing in the open to feel jitters, butterflies, uh, because of the, the special place you are. And, and I guess over in the States, Nick Pebble Beach may well be one of these to, to Americans. When they go to Pebble Beach, they maybe feel the same as we feel at St. Andrews. That's right, Ewan. It's just, just getting you on the line there. This modern technology that we have had to <laughs> accustom to over the last few months. Um, but you're right, the history there is su such an integral part of why it feels so special. And you mentioned the town and playing out away from the old grey toon and then back towards it. How much do you think, Sir Nick, that the town and that skyline mm. plays a part in shaping your round, particularly on the back nine when you're coming towards it? You've got the famous steeple that is yeah. such a, an iconic part of that skyline. How, how important has that been to you during your rounds there in, on the old course? And for we golfers, that view as you come down 13 and you get on top of the, the hillocks and 14 and look right down the dunes, right down the links, um, and then you've got the silhouette of St Andrews. For us, in the, as golfers, that is the greatest golf view on this planet. I know, you know, Pebble's beautiful and all those, but for golfers and a golf view, that is the greatest view in golf. It really is. I mean, I, it gives give me chill bumps now even to think about it. But, you know, when you're actually out there on a great day with a bit of sunshine and what have you, and you've actually got those few moments to, to put your, lift your head up and, and enjoy the view, um, there's nothing quite like that. There really isn't. You mentioned there 1990, obviously, um, you came out on top at St Andrews, the old course, one of your three um, open championship victories. Obviously, mastering the course had taken a lot of work because you spoke openly about, you know, remodeling your swing, specifically with winning at the old course in mind. And being a good links player, there are intricacies within the skill set that you need as a golfer to be able to master it. And I'm just wondering what you think that those are, so Nick, and, you know, if you're an excellent golfer, does that necessarily mean you're going to be an excellent links player by default? Probably not, because, you know, um, many golfers in America, have, you know, when you talk to them about links, they don't understand, you know, they think they have a links, um, let's just say in um, anything next to the ocean, you know, but they don't appreciate that, that that sand is tens of thousands of years old and it is, it is rock hard sand. It's not like a, you know, a, a created golf course. Um, so that's, so understanding the terrain, that's the, so the most important thing, yeah, I don't, if there's no wind, you have to understand the terrain and you have to play the terrain. And, you know, but then when the wind gets up, which generally there will be something, then it all becomes about trajectory. And then, you know, so your most important thing is what, what lie do you have right in front of you? And then what trajectory have you got? That was my first question. So, you know, to what flight has this got to go? You know, when the wind's coming and I've got all sorts of things going on, I've got to, I would see straight away, this ball has to fly at that level. I can't go here and I, and I don't want to go there. So I want it to fly at that level. So, so once you've seen a trajectory that you know in your head, that's, well, that's like a four iron. But then you discuss your yardages and the caddy, you will say, well, no, it's only 165 yards. 
And you go, yeah, but I, the ball's got to fly at that level. So do I either take another club and put it on that trajectory or do I say, mm, I'll take the four iron because I know I hit it on that trajectory and I'll make it just go a shorter distance to, 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 to fit. And the, the other thing I love, it becomes a, there's a bounce and there's a run as well and a release, whatever you want to call it. So you have to stand, understand where you're going to land it, where it's going to bounce to. I mean, I never forget now I sit here saying to, to Fanny Sunison, my famous caddy, and said, okay, we go, right, it's going to bounce at 45. Sorry, it's going to land at 45. That means it will bounce at 50 and then 55 sort of thing. And you can see it going boom, boom. And I said, and then, it's, and then it would have another anything from 10 to 20 yards release. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have to calculate. And that's, so then you draw, wow. So when you think of it, you have a flag, and you then have to bring this landing point back into a certain place into the green and what is happening in that certain place in that green. Mm -hmm. So is it landing on a down, up slope, down slope, left, right, all this sort of thing. And then so when you've, when you've done your preparation, well, that hopefully happens like that pretty quick. You know, you, you can see it and sense it, but that's what people don't understand um, when they come to play a Lynx the first time that, is putting all of those three elements to carry the bounce and then the release, put all three of them together. That makes a, that's a completely different. So you can't arrive saying, I hit my, I hit my eight iron 155. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean diddly on yeah. a Lynx course. You've got to learn to numbers on the club. Doesn't matter. It's, it's, it will fly at that level. It's going to land and release. That's how you, that's how I used to calculate it all. It's by the time, you got to the Open in St Andrews in 1990. What shot did you feel was most valuable to you in your armour? What did you feel like, if all else fails, I've got this shot that I can fall yeah. back on? Well, no, I think it's my consistency. It was as simple as that. You know, I, you, know you, you plot the golf course, and number one, you've got to stay away from the, the bunkers off the tee shot because mm -hmm. those really, because it's not such, not, they're usually more than a one shot penalty because you usually make a mess and leave it in mm. and, and you and i can promise you at any level you're scared of that i mean you can get caught with a crazy bad life bad luck you've got to come backwards or you don't even have a shot sort of thing mm. and you leave it you try something and you know and i think from years before i'd made rules that you wasn't going to try anything risky out of them you just played out of them you don't even try six irons out you just wedge and get on with it. So I think I made that as number one priority. Like I'm not going to hit it in the bunkers. And then, and um, and obviously my iron shots were very good. And yeah, the, the 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 amazing thing about St Andrews is that when you miss shots on a regular golf course, you miss it by ten feet, twenty feet, thirty feet, forty feet. Say, at St Andrews, they find a way of ending up ten yards, twenty yards, thirty yards maybe even 40 yards away, not necessarily bad shots. You know, you tweak it on the wind and get the bounce. Mm -hmm. A shot like that on a normal course would be 20 feet from the hole, mm -hmm. but not St. Andrews. It goes off and it ends up 20 yards. So you obviously have to be mentally prepared for that because yeah. you then have got to be a great putter from 20 and 30 yards and you actually mm -hmm. get kind of, you get kind of used to it. You don't even, you don't even think about it. If you did that on a, on a regular golf course, you think, oh my goodness, 30 yard putt, that's the full length of a green. Well, you touched on mental resilience, which we'll come back to in a minute. And if you are talking of one shot, you surely got to, you got to um, recall the final shot you hit on the opening round, which yeah. has gone, you know, is, is one of the most played clips around <laughs> the, the old course in St. Andrews. I've tried to re replay it myself in real life when I was there during yeah. lockdown and it didn't, I don't even think I got past the Valley of Sin, but um, that was an incredible shot and a fantastic start to your week there. Can you recall how you felt coming off? Yeah that opening ride, a 67, I think. You well, it. See, so the reason why I reacted like that, because you that's Thursday afternoon, you're a bit of a nutter to react like that. Mm. And I set a goal. When I got there, I set a goal. I played my practice and obviously I'd, I'd won the Masters, I'd hit the whole of the US, I, and I genuinely came on the mission. I was really upset when I lost the, uh, the, the Open, US Open. Mm. I mean, really, really upset. And I vowed while I was sitting there on the loo in the clubhouse, I said, I'm going to go and win St. Andrews. So I was on a mission. Mm -hmm. And after playing the practice rounds, I said to myself, I can shoot 67 around here. That's my par. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Very nice. And so 
Whereas I came up the la, and I genuinely believed it. I thought I could shoot 67 rounder every day. And mm -hmm. so I came up the last, only three under. So I'm off schedule. Mm -hmm. And I came to that bump and run shot, and I read it. I looked at that, and I thought, mm, if I land it there, it will kick there, and it will go up the hill. And I plotted it. I didn't really, to be honest, I didn't plot it going in. Sure, but I plotted that bump and run. And I went with my A time, which I wouldn't, like, as you hear me, what is it, 30 years later, keep harping on about on TV, old school, chip it with your A time. Mm -hmm. And boom, and I hit this thing because it went boom, 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 went up the hill, crossed sideways because it goes up and then goes sideways. Yeah. And bombing in. So that to me was like 67. <laughs> 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 I was back on schedule. That was really, that's why. Because when you see that, you, that's a Sunday afternoon reaction. And that was a yeah. Friday, that was Thursday afternoon. So it's pretty, give you some idea how important it was for me to get kind of on, on schedule. Mm, no, absolutely. It's a brilliant, brilliant shot. And I think probably only Constantina Rocca rivals it in terms of shots that have been played yeah. to the Valley of Sin. Yeah. You, you played in four opens. Can you tell me what you felt were your strengths as a Lynx player? Uh, my first Open was 1964, believe it or not. I was nine years of age, uh, won by Tony Lima. And it was the first time I'd seen great players play. My father was a, a professional and I caddied for him as a kid against other club professionals. But this was my first sight of St Andrews and my first sight of an Open Championship. So I think at that stage of your life, you, you learn very quickly. You learn by imitation. Uh, although my father was, was pro at a, a parkland course, I played a lot of golf as a kid uh, at places like Gillen, North Berwick, Dunbar, uh, whatever. So Lynx golf was really quite natural to me, and I preferred it to, to parkland golf because mm -hmm. of, of what Nick's just said there, the, the imagination that, that you need. You have to work out exactly what shot is going to pay dividends at the end of it. So I just enjoyed playing all of Lynx golf. And my first Open at St Andrews were, was the same as Nick's uh, in, in 1978. And, and they were special times. There were so many great players around at that time. Johnny Miller had just won the Open a couple of years earlier uh, at Birkdale. Uh, Lee Trevino had won back-to-back -back, uh, at Birkdale and, of course, uh, at Muirfield as well in that great tussle with Jackman. I think when you go to the Open for the first time, there's something that stays with you forever. Mm. And, and it, my first Open was, was 73 at um, Trun, but I was just out of school. I was 17, 18 years of age. So I don't remember much about that, but there's no question when you go to St. Andrews, there is a different feeling. I'm probably unable to explain why, unless it's the the history and because I'm Scottish and because it's the home of golf and because I played there at 10 years of age and, and played many rounds uh, around there. there. There's just something that stays with you at St Andrews. So you learn all the shots as a kid. Um, there are different shots at Birkdale and, and Royal Lytham uh, as opposed to St Andrews. Mm. St Andrews mm. is unique. I mean, when Nick was talking about the trajectory there, that's the process of thought that a player has to go through. He has to visualize that. He has to anticipate the first bounce. And the hardest part is the release. How far is it going to go? Is the wind going to pick up halfway mm -hmm. through it? Will it blow to the back of the green? Will it hold up at the front of the green? So rather than saying what shots you need to play around there, imagination is 98% is of it. And, and all of the players who play in the Open can obviously play the game. So they do know how to put the club on the ball and knock it down and take it up in the air and try and stop it a bit quicker. But 98% is in your visualisation before you actually stand up and hit the shot. So that's what I learned very quickly at a very young age. That particular skill set, visualisation, mental resilience, having the patience when so Nick mentioned earlier on about the ball finishing 30 yards away rather than you know 20 feet away. Do you did you feel Ewan when you when you teed off in an open championship that you could almost rule out some of the field in terms of competition because you, they might not have the skill set 
perhaps if they hadn't grown up in Scotland like you had, and or or perhaps had much experience on Lynx golf courses, did you feel like the real competition was a smaller field? Definitely, uh, I I would say that um, we we've had so many good players down the years. Uh, we've had great Lynx players, I and mean, Tom Watson wasn't a great Lynx player in the very early part of his career, but. When he won the playoff against Jack Newton in, in 75 at Carnoustie, he was always called the bridesmaid. He was always the one that was going to be second. So players have looked at Lynx goal and adapted to it. When Bobby Jones went to St Andrews for the first time, he thought that was the worst place he'd ever seen. So it, it took him a year to fall in love with St Andrews, where other people do, I think, a lot quicker. But there is no question that if you've been brought up playing a lot of Lynx golf, you're at a big advantage going into an Open Championship. But that's not all. Uh, to win the Open, you, you need to have everything. You need to have belief. You need to have the visualisation I talked about, the skills to play all the different shots. Uh, we haven't talked yet about, about holding one up in a right-to-left wind and fading the ball against that to get it to die. And vice versa, sometimes on the way in, when the wind was coming off St Andrews Bay, for instance, so there's an awful lot you need to be an Open champion at any Open links. I think you need even more to be the champion at, at St Andrews. And the golf Nick played from 1990 to 1992 uh, was perhaps the finest golf that I've seen as a player uh, and as a commentator. Uh, in his pump, as they call it, <laughs> if he was on song in these two years, he was pretty much unbeatable. And... So, Nick, on the play, the golf you played between 1990 and 1992, who do you feel inspired you the most as, in terms of another player? Who was it that you really drew inspiration from um, around Lynx golf courses like the old course? Well, you know, Seve was our man in, in Europe. Um, you know, in 84, I was battling with him. I made a mess of day three. And... Um, but then when I came back in, in 90, Greg was the main man. Greg was the man to be at that particular time. And that, and that actually was my goal at the beginning of the week. I mean, you'd always look across and, and go, okay, these five guys or so. And I honestly said, Greg's, if I beat Greg, I'll, be, I'll win this week. So that's how I held him that particular week. And so it was quite typical, you know, after two days, we'd both tied at 12 under. And, we, and off we go and play round three together. Um, which became a famous round as well, you know. So um, you know, just wanted to add a couple of different things. You know, playing links call the difference with St Andrews because the green is so enormous. You do a lot of that landing and, as I say, bounce and release. A lot of that is done on the greens, you know, mm -hmm. because it's so huge. There's only a few holes you have to land it. Big decisions on five. Where do you land it in the gully before? Do you land it short and release it on that sort of thing? Um, but then when you go to other court, obviously Muirfield, then you have to have all your calculations and all your, not your calculations, but you have to plot it. You have to understand what's happening 30 and 40 yards before because um, you have to land it short of the greens and get it to release. And you have to know absolutely everything. I've got to tell one funny story because in 93 down at Royal St. George's, I went down early with, with Fanny Sunison and it was burnt. Burnt, 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 like you'd never seen before. And we played three days practice and we had it completely plotted. For example, the, <laughs> fifth, the fifth hole round the corner, this is a funny little par four, isn't it? Not the prettiest of par fours. That was like a five iron off the tee. And that, honestly, you, you and appreciate this. We had it calculated. If there was a tiny bit of wind, it would release 60 yards. You had to land the ball, as I, true as I sit here, you had to land the ball 60 yards short. It was like white, the grass was white. And the ball would run 60 yards into the middle of that green, okay? So we had it all calculated. <laughs> Wednesday night, it pours with friggin' rain. <laughs> I, would have, I would have walked that open. I was the only one that had all of this. I knew you had to land it 20, 30, 40, 60 yards short of some greens to release it into the green. Had it all mapped out and then it rained. Ugh. Mm. So I just, one of my, hey, not everything comes out your way with all your preparation, but um, 
Can you t talk for a moment, um, so Nick, about how you felt the emotions coming down the stretch when you were in contention in 1990? It's everything you've been working yeah. towards. And what what well, are you even feeling at that time? Well, you know, as I said, I went there on a mission, and I, at least you can say it 30 years later because people and I, and I said to myself, right, I'm going to win by five, mm -hmm. right? And so it's funny when you're out there saying if you've said to yourself i'm going to win by five you then say okay mate you've actually got to be leading by five that means you've actually got to be leading at any stage so that <laughs> really kept kept me going pushing you and it, and it's kind of like and sure enough after day three i'm leading by five and um so then it was it was weird so that's sunday morning i came over and practiced i, I did like a double practice I stayed at the old course. I come over in the morning and I do a full little routine just to kill time. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, going off at 3.30 is a real, you know, one of the hardest things in golf to sit mm -hmm. around all day. So I thought I'd rather be doing something. So I went across and I did the full mini session, short game on the range, up to the putting green and back. And that killed a good hour plus by that time. And I came in and I have some lunch. I was even relaxed enough to have a little snooze afternoon snooze you know and then i came back out again and did it all again and then somebody said to me on those on the putting green you know um i can't remember the exact words but like we can't go for it because uh, you don't want to blow you don't want to waste them but you don't know and so it kind of threw me because when every time i then faced the putt i then thought so what do i do with this one do i go for it i'm five ahead but if i make a silly three putt and waste one, you know, that would, would that hurt me more? So, you know, if leading by five is just not as easy as, oh, it's over and done with, because especially if you're expected to win and all that sort of thing. So anyway, it, it's kind of threw me for the day. And then sure enough, um, Payne Stewart, dear Payne Stewart, with them got within two. Mm -hmm. They were coming down the 15th hole and I'm only leading by two now. And, and that was really the time when I sort of said, okay, I've got to make a move now. I've got to, I've got to give myself a cushion again. Mm. And, um, hey, my 15th hole was always good to me. Five iron again. I hit a little ditty five iron, chip and run five iron, fed it down the slopes and to about eight feet and made three. So that gave me my three-shot cushion, which I thought was fine and you like trying to keep it. And, you know, these guys then got into trouble up 17. Uh, yeah, and I still ended up winning by five. So. Um, you don't have time to, you're not wandering along thinking I'm winning the open by five. You, I can promise you, you are completely, <laughs> in, you are completely engrossed in what you do on every single yeah. shot. Mm. Um, and then as you said, then finally, when we got to 18 um, and, he, and you never count your chickens after I hit my tee shot. And so that's fine. Uh -huh. Then I know when we went over the Swilkin bridge, I said to her, um, um, I said, you're going to lift your head up and take, take this in. You'll be able to re-watch a lot of the shots that you hit during that final round of the Open um, if you do tune in to the Open of the Ages, which, uh, of course, is coming this Sunday. Yeah. You and both Sir Nick and yourself played in the 1978 and 1984 Opens at St Andrews. Any standout memories from that week for you, from either of those weeks? Oh, you get so many memories uh, from an open championship from from the time you get there at the beginning of the week until the time you you leave the town at the end of it i think probably the the final round in 84 i played with ben crenshaw uh for the first time i uh, met him for the first time and a friendship that's lasted all these years 35 years since then mm -hmm. and i remember the the t-shot i had to eight was a was a six iron and you, Nick and, and everyone who's been at St Andrews will know that when you get to the loop, that's another part of St Andrews. So it's the most wonderful arena, left mm. of the 11th tee and, and left of the 8th and 9th. Yeah. And I had my six arms about 18 inches. And, and being Scottish, the, there was a reasonable cheer. And I thought, <laughs> well, that's quite good. I'll be able to pick up a birdie here. Ben teed up and knocked it straight in the hole. Oh, <laughs> hold it. Oh, God. Nice. <laughs> hold it quite. <laughs> now, ben was a very popular uh, mm. visitor to our show. So he came over and played in the, the Carroll's Irish Open, uh, which was usually the week after the Open Championship in the mid-70s. 
So he had a lot of fans and, and he was just so popular, a lot of people walked with him uh, wherever he played. The noise to the, from the eighth tee mm -hmm. to the eighth green to pick the ball out, wave to the crowd, do all the stuff you do, mm -hmm. walk back to the ninth tee. The noise actually had me shaking. <laughs> now, now I had a, a tapping, so it didn't take long. I mean, once we got in the green, he picked the ball out of the hole, tapped it, and walked to the ninth tee. I was shaking so much, I couldn't tee the ball up at the ninth. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to just drop drop it on the tee and hit a three wood and 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 try and avoid the the Kruger bunkers or, or well, the end bunkers, whatever they're called up there. Mm -hmm. at night so that was a very special moment uh, the, the day before I played with Johnny Miller who had won the Open Championship in in 76 uh, and US Open champion as well it was lovely to play with them uh, but if I, I look back at St Andrews I think every time that I've stepped onto the tee whether it be in the Open Championship or whether it be with friends and uh, a bounce game that that is always a very special moment in your mm -hmm. life and it's one you don't forget Mm. Yeah, well, I, you're right. I played 78, and I believe um, after 27 holes, I might have even been leading. So I thought well, that probably scared me. And I finished four back to Jack winning. And that is actually when I vowed to myself, I said, I, oh, well, it was Sunday morning. I was close, and I woke up, and I was staying in Dundee. And that night, I felt my chest was just crushed. You know, I was just thinking about all of this. I just, and uh, and because mum and dad were there, and I said, God, oh, I can hardly sleep like that. I felt like being crushed because my mother gave up. Okay, don't be so daft, get on with it. And you'd like some <laughs> encouraging words like that. So and I think, oh, it is. And I finished four back. And um, so, the, yeah, that was the first time I said to myself, okay, I can win the Open. I'm going to win the Open one day. And obviously, it took a long time to then work on it. Um, as you said, and then 84 was Seve's time. Um, I was right in there. Hit some great shots out of the left rough for 17. My goodness, that was one of the, to, geez, to hit, a, hit one of the greatest shots. Hit a six iron out of that rough and managed to get it on the green or something. I mean, it doesn't sound much now, but when you, when you go and visit that rough and it's just a tangle and everything, and you've got to get this thing airborne and make it run and release. And well, oh, actually swooped it around the, the corner. Um, I've got great memory. I mean, goodness, it was <laughs> actually my very, you'll love this one, Ewan. Um, that 78 open, I hit it short left. Oh, I hope you got this on film. I hit it short left of the road hole bunker, about 20 yards short of it with a pin right behind it, right? And I, I've got no shot this way. So I looked at the bank, you know, the, you know, the bunker sits here and the, and the bank comes down there. So there's a, there's a grass bank, isn't there? So I looked at the bank and I thought, well, if I chip it into the bank, I'll send it over that way. And so I had the rusty old Wilson thing, you know, and I, so I chipped it into it and I dropped the club because I didn't hit it hard enough. And the ball hit the bank, rolled all the way around the top of the bank, thought about it, rolled down the other side to two feet, right? <laughs> Got, then, and then on 18, <laughs> Then on 18, I hit it on the road. In those days, we hit three wood, didn't we? And I ended up on the road. And because I played it off the road, and I chipped an eight iron from the road into the wind and hold the putt. So I finished four, three. I could have finished seven, five. And I finished four, three. So, hey, it was um, and my very last go at St. Andrews, you know, when, uh, was that that long ago now? To, to, um, when on earth was that? 2015? 2015, yeah. Yeah, my life, you know, I made, I made, I was a nervous wreck because all I wanted to do was get to the 17, uh, to get to Swilking Bridge with my Pringle sweater. I got my Pringle Bermin sweater in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> on, and I hit it on the front of the green. I hit five wood into the Bermin 17 on that. And I came on the front, I got that, and I honestly looked at it and I said, I have no idea what to do this part. <laughs> I, and I did. I asked the golfing guy. I said, "Please, don't give me help. I need help on this. I have no idea what to do." <laughs> I was half, I was shaking, and I just hit this thing, and it went and, and went in. And, and I couldn't birdie. believe. It. I, I thought, "I can't." I birdied seventeen. My last official go. I thought, "Wow, it doesn't get any better than that." You know, incredible. Yeah. Well, a seventy-one and a brilliant part on the eighteenth to finish 
your experience around the old course must have been incredibly special and to have your son by your side Matthew even more so yeah yeah it was a great week it fine you know it all came out in the wash you know, to, as I said to get on the Swilkin Bridge which is another good point as, as Ewan was saying that I can promise we think about that because every great golfer well, every golfer walks across the Swalking Bridge mm -hmm. from the salt of the earth to the greatest players in the world. So it's a rather nice, I, I think about every time when you go over and think, obviously Sam and Hogan and, and, and Bobby Jones, my goodness, and Jack, and you suddenly start thinking, every great golfer just walked across that tiny little bridge. Mm -hmm. It's another lovely little thing in our game that we, very few other sports, I guess other sports have, you know, they're sacred grounds, but that is a that is a sacred piece of uh, stone. That bridge, it's really is special to us. So, um, yeah, that you know, as I said, that was that was my mission to get on the bridge in my Pringle, <laughs> still well, fit, there you go. and uh, and sit. It was a, it was my hundredth major, and I didn't realize that until they told me at the beginning of the round. I thought oh, it kind of makes sense to call it a day <laughs> of my hundredth major. Yeah, incredible. Well, it was a very special memory for everyone watching, but you will have experienced that more yeah. than anyone. Um, you and I'm going to jump back to you for a minute. I'm conscious of time and I don't want to keep you guys for much longer. But before we bring this to a close, I just wanted to know you, working on the Open for the ages, and of course, the old course is famous for having not changed a great deal in terms of its architecture and layout over the last 50 years. It's, it's lengthened slightly, but compared to how much further the lads hit the ball, it hasn't actually lent and a great deal and I, I certainly was struck by how the course is very much the same over the ages but the way that the players play the course and took on the shots I think the 17th is a great example. It worked well the, the open for the ages in the sense that it's, it's over 50 years it, it goes back to just after the turn of the 70s to where we are today so the likes of, of Jack Nicholas, let's say at uh, 14 uh, Savvy at 14, Nick, when he first played there at the 14th, the Beardies would be in play uh, of the tee they were playing off then, and they would still be in play for the likes of McElroy uh, five years ago when Zach Johnson won. So I think that's one of the reasons the Open for the Ages worked extremely well. They had woods, persimmon woods off what was the tees we grew up on, mm. and then they had the metal woods uh, or the, the titanium woods they, they have now off the back tees, so the tee shots really weren't an awful lot different, which meant the second shots were, were pretty much the same. But I do think well, we will have to look at that in the future, but for now we should enjoy the Open for the Ages. It's a stunning production. It's over a thousand hours of putting it together, and uh, it will be wonderful viewing over the, the three hours. Uh, a great memories for those who grew up with the likes of, of Nick, uh, of Jack, of Lee Trevino, of Gary Player, all the, the players that played in the 70s and the 80s. And then we move into the 90s uh, and all the good players we had then. And then we move into the modern era. So there's something in there for everyone. And I would congratulate everyone who's put this together. It's a very special production. You're absolutely right, Ewan. It's incredibly special. And the, the glimpses I've seen, I know that we've been, we've only been given the, as much information as we absolutely needed because it's all top secret and we can't reveal much at all. We can't say anything about the pairings. But what I will say is that I was totally convinced that these players were all competing on the same day around the old course in St Andrews. And it was just incredible the way that it, that it draws the viewer in into fully believing that. Did you find the same, Ewan? Definitely, and, and sometimes you forget how good the players were in the 70s, the way Trevino moved the, the ball around. Mm. Watching Nick um, around his, his good times uh, out there in the fairways, you forget how well he swung the club, how disciplined he was. Mm -hmm. you know, so much talk now about Bryson uh, at the moment is probably the most talked about player mm -hmm. because of the changes in, in his body and the length he hits mm. it there. Mm. But you look back at, at players like Greg Norman, and uh, Nick mentioned earlier, a wonderful golfer, great driver of the golf ball. And it was lovely to see them. Players I had played with in the 70s and 80s remembered how good they were. Nick Price would be another one of these. Um, mm. So it was lovely to look back there. And a lot of the younger viewers now will have seen clips of these players. Mm -hmm. But this time they're going to feel they're seeing them live 
yeah. against Jordan Spieth, against Rory McIlroy, against Zach Johnson and Louis Estherson, who are also featured uh, in there. And I, I think they'll enjoy that. They'll appreciate yes. these players more. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you've got the older lads who will still enjoy watching the golf today. There's some phenomenal golf being played today. Uh, hopefully, when we get all the tours back, we'll, we'll enjoy that in the future. But this is, uh, this is going to be a very special three hours. And uh, I congratulate everyone that was involved in it. Definitely. I, I'd second that. And I'd say it was, as I, I'm clinging to my 20s here, I was, um, <laughs> I felt that it would, you know, yeah. I, I, I almost, I almost just fall into the category of, you know, younger golfers. I'm going to hang on to that for as long as I can. And, and Sir Nick, you won in 1990 and I was born in 1990. And actually I was doing some of the on-course commentary for your round um, as part of the Open for the Ages. So I feel like I know your final round around St Andrews probably <laughs> almost as well as you do. And I just felt like it was such a good education in golf for anyone who's passionate about golf and who might have seen these broken up clips from the archives. You know, you kind of think, oh, yeah. you know, special moments um, that, you, that you remember. But seeing it all together and having the opportunity to sit down and enjoy it this Sunday, I just think it will be so special. And, and like you say, Ewan, it's a huge achievement that the technology that's been used to fully convince, but things like the, you know, the, the technology they've used to change the, the grandstands, to change banners, to, to dis make things disappear that would have, you know, mislead the viewer. It's incredibly impressive. But I think what we can definitely conclude after our conversation today that links golf is more than just the shots you hit. It's what's in the mind, it's the patience, it's the strategy over all four rounds. And there's a creativity that you need to oh, yeah. play well on Lynx golf and to become an open champion around the old course in St Andrews. So I think we'll wrap it up there, guys. You've been very generous with your time and it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you both about your memories around St Andrews, the old course, and I hope that you enjoy the Open for the Ages as much as I Super. will this, this Sunday. Yeah, I, I think I definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> I think you will. You, you, didn't sure you, hear, will uh, you didn't hear Iona's on-course commentary about you, Nick. It was <laughs> only disappointing, but I mean, when, when you hit it to 20 feet, you'd pushed it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest thing. The biggest <laughs> obstacle I had was um, the, the yellow jumper and, and how I managed to make that look as though it was still in fashion today in this generic Still in era. fashion? It's, it's my God, yeah, it's iconic. Yeah, that will, that will never die, that intarsia. My God, that's the finest Mongolian cashmere I have yet. <laughs> Gee whiz. Yeah. Well, you looked fantastic. And so my thanks to you and Murray and Sir Nick Faldo and we hope Thank you enjoyed you. this special bonus yeah, episode of the open podcast remember visit the open.com and the open social media channels for all the build-up towards the open for the ages and of course the big one the open for the ages final round broadcast this sunday the 19th of july at 11 a.m bst 6 a.m est make sure you tune in to see who will triumph in the open for the ages thank you and see you next time <laughs>